Hi everybody, hope you are having a great day and we are going to take notes even though I'm not there doesn't mean the learning has to stop. So I have created a wonderful PowerPoint for you and I'm going to teach you about water on the surface. Um, hopefully you have the sheet from the substitute to fill out. If you don't, take the moment right now um, to pause this video and make sure you have a sheet and a pencil ready because we're going to get moving. And because this is a video, there will be no stopping um, unless the substitute sees a need to pause the video. All right, so we're going to talk about water on the surface today. And this is chapter 7, section 2. Yesterday we talked about um, the water cycle and um, we drew graphics about the water cycle and now we're going to talk about what happens when the water actually hits Earth's surface. Okay, so number one, what is a river system? And I do not know whether the sheet in front of you is the same underline as this PowerPoint because I don't happen to have that sheet in front of me right now as I'm recording this uh, presentation. So if it's not the right thing, please make the right corrections. I'm hoping that what's underlined here coincides with what's underlined on your sheet. Okay, so what is a river system? This is a river and all of its tributaries. If you remember, we talked about a tributary before, and that's a smaller river that feeds into a larger river. Um, so examples that we gave before is if this is my river system, and um, I've got two rivers feeding into it. These two rivers that are feeding into it are called tributaries. Uh, this one happens to be the Mattapanai, and this one is the Pamunkey in our example, and they feed into the York River. So they are the York River's tributaries. And all of this together, if you consider everything that feeds into this river, the whole thing is called a river system. And I'm sorry, my pen does not write very well on this screen. It's kind of glitchy. So you just have to bear with the technology we have. All right, so number two. Oh, before I go to number two, I want to show you a picture, an aerial view of a real river system. And you will see that right here. Oops, I apologize. You will see that right in the center here, we have the main river right here. And then all of these other rivers are feeding into that main river. So these other rivers out here are called the tributaries. And you can see you've got a tributary right here that's kind of dried up a little bit. It must not have rained in a while. But I bet when that rains, that fills up pretty quickly. And then this just flows right on into this river right here. So all of this together, this whole total thing, is called a river system. Okay. All right, so now we're going to move on to number two, which is a watershed. And I think of when I see the words water and shed, well, a shed is something I have in my might have in my backyard. I don't really have one, but it might be a place in my backyard where I keep water. So a shed is like a building where I keep water. Well, if I think of that, I'm going to remember that a watershed is land area that supplies water to a river system. So it's a place where a river gets its water. It's a watershed. Okay? And it could be any of the land. If we look back on our picture um, here, you will see this whole area, any of this. Oops, I'm sorry. I have to get used to pushing the pin down here on the bottom. All of this area right here, when it rains, all of this stuff drains in to these little tributaries and they eventually feed into this big river. So this whole area is called the watershed. So a watershed is a land area that supplies water to a river system, drainage or drainage basin. Um, the water flows across a watershed on its way to a stream. So when you live in Virginia, um, being on the coastline, we have several watersheds and our watersheds 
lead into three main areas. So whenever any rain that falls on the state of Virginia is going to go to three main places. It's going to go to the Chesapeake Bay, the North Carolina Sounds, and the Gulf of Mexico. Now it depends on where, um, in what part of Virginia the rain falls as to where it's going to end up. If you're on the west portion of Virginia, then it's going to go to the Mississippi River and down into the Gulf of Mexico. If the rain falls on the southernmost portion of Virginia, then you're, it's going to go into the North Carolina Sound. And any other portion, the northern port uh, part and the southern part of Virginia is going to go eventually into the Chesapeake Bay. So you are writing hopefully Chesapeake, North Carolina and Mexico. And in a minute I'm going to show you a picture, um, a map of Virginia, and we have several watersheds even though um, they go into these three main areas, Chesapeake Bay, North Carolina Sound, and Gulf of Mexico. We have several watersheds, and I'm going to switch that now. Okay, so here we have a map of Virginia, and all of these areas are the watersheds. Now, if you look on this map, you live, if you're in West Point, we are right here. Okay, right, right where that red dot is. So what watershed do we live in? I don't know if y'all answered or not, but if you did, we live, you should have said York. You live in the York River watershed. A watershed is named by the river, the last river that flows into this area. Okay, what's a second? All right, so let me go back. You live in the York River, and then we have um, the Rappahannock above us. So if you live in the Tappahannock area, you might be, live in the Rappahannock. If you live in Charles City, which is down here, you live in the James River watershed. Now it all goes, all of these rivers right here, Right about from, right here is the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, so you have the Appalachian Mountains right here. Alright, so everything on this side is going to flow into the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so that's part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Everything down here is going to flow into the North Carolina Sounds, the Shawan and the Roanoke. We're going to flow into the North Carolina Sound, and then everything on this side of the Appalachian Mountains is going to flow into the Mississippi River and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. Right, so we're going to look at what a divide is, and we've talked about a divide before. Um, think about the mountains and how they divide the land, and so a divide is a ridge of land that separates watersheds. Um, a good example of a divide in Virginia is the Appalachian Mountains. It kind of splits up out of the ground and divides the land. So it's a ridge of land that separates watersheds. Uh, this is not a picture that I'm about to show you of the Appalachian Mountains, um, but I think it's a good image of how the land is divided. So hopefully you're writing down divide, ridge, and watersheds. And here's a picture of a divide. See how this just kind of juts up and it separates the land. All right, so a flood. Ugh, we've seen flood in West Point sometimes um, when we have a whole bunch of water. We've increased our volume of water and the water has gone out of the river channel and into the floodplain around it. So a flood is when the volume of water increases so much that a river comes up out of its channel and onto the land that surrounds it. So um, hopefully you're writing flood, volume, and overflow. What I like about this is um, I'm about to show you um, a doctored movie image of a flood in England. 
Um, this did not really happen. Uh, you can see here you've got um, England as it really is. This is a accurate aerial photo of England and then this is a simulated um, doctored movie image of a flood in England and um, if you look I've kind of pointed out this is that Ferris wheel here and here it is here so if um, that channel the Thames were to flow flood out of its channel it would go all into this land on either side of that river and um, it would be devastating. There's Big Ben right there. Okay, so how do we control them? We can see that it can be devastating if it happens. How do we stop it from happening? What are some things that we can do? Um, there are some things that we do to control flooding. Uh, one thing that we might control it with is a dam. We might put in a dam. Um, and we also can reinforce natural levees. And I'm going to show you a picture in a minute of what a levee is. Um, I believe I've brought it up in class before. I'm not sure that you guys still have a good understanding of it. So you should be writing controlling dams and levees. Okay, and so in this picture we have coming up, I have a picture of the Hoover Dam right here. Okay, and then so we're kind of controlling the water down here. When it gets too high in the back, we'll release the water out of the front of the dam. And we have, in this instance, you'll see a picture of a flood where this river down here has actually broken through this natural levee. This was just a buildup of dirt um, that kind of helps keep the river in its channel, but in this case the river kind of overflowed its natural levee and spilled out into this field out here. So um, this levee is a buildup of natural land, um, trees, debris, that type of thing, that will um, keep the river in its channel. And what we can do is if we anticipate a flood to happen, we can bulldoze or take sandbags and try and increase the height, just put up here on the side of the river and try and increase the height of this natural levee in order to prevent this water from flowing into the land or the floodplain around it. Okay, so what's the difference between a lake and a pond? Around here, we usually say pond. Um, you might hear lakes more out west um, or up north. Um, a difference is, is that um, a pond is going to be shallow, um, and a lake is going to be pretty deep. A pond is going to have a lot of grass and debris in it, or um, it's going to let sunlight touch the bottom, so it's going to... Um, have a lot of algae or green stuff growing in the bottom of it and a lake is going to be pretty sandy bottom pretty clear looking um, they're both great habitats for wildlife um, again the pond is going to be pretty shallow um, so that the sunlight can actually touch the bottoms because the bottoms kind of muddy and murky and kind of silty where a lake is going to be really clear and pristine and a lot deeper um, so what we have um, in my pictures is I'm going to actually show you a picture. There's a pond. As you can see, it's got sunlight. It's pretty shallow. It's got sunlight touching the bottom. And then this is a lake. Um, it's very blue, pristine, um, large. So again, pond and lake, lake and pond. All right, so... What is a reservoir? R-E-S-E-R-V-O-I-R. -E and a reservoir is a lake that stores water for human use. Okay, so people are going to use it 
Um, we in this area, given that we are, have a lot of rivers and stuff, we don't really use the reservoir, but Newport News, um, they really need a reservoir because they do not have enough water in their area to supply water to everybody who lives in Hampton, Newport News, Virginia Beach area. And so what they try and do is they try and take water from the area around us actually and they try and put it in pipes and transport it down to Newport News, Virginia Beach so that they can have enough water. Um, they actually tried to use the Mattapanai River as a reservoir, the area around the Mattapanai River, and um, that was going to be a big problem because it would prevent our shad fishing in the area, and um, it was going to be a big economical issue with the Mattapanai Indian Reservation. And so we tried to fight it, but we weren't successful, but the Indian Reservation um, finally went into the lawsuit and fought it and they won. And so Newport News will not be putting a reservoir in our area anytime in the near future. Um, here's an example of a reservoir. You can see what they'll do is they'll take great, make these great big areas and they'll pull water in from different locations and localities and everything and they'll keep it in here and they'll draw bits of water bit by bit, filter it, clean it, and then send it out to the homes around here or even further away like um, you know another town or city nearby. So that's a reservoir. Uh, lake turnover. Lake turnover. I, as I say those words you know you start to think mm, that kind of sounds like apple turnover. <laughs> But it's really not the same thing. Um, lake turnover is when the water shifts in a lake or a pond. And that happens seasonally. So it's when a change in temperature causes the upper water and the lower water to switch places. So if we were to draw a picture of it, what we would say is, let me change this pen color to blue. Okay, so in the summertime, if you've ever gone swimming in the summer, the bottom of the lake or river is kind of cold, okay, because it takes a while for that to heat up. So it stays pretty cold down here. And then the top of the lake or river is kind of warm. So I'm going to change my pen color here to red to represent warm. Okay, and so this is in the summertime. But in the winter time, it's the opposite. The warm water's down at the bottom because it hasn't had a chance to get cold yet. It finally, at the end of summer, this water down here at the bottom finally got warm. But as that happened, then the temperature started to get cold again. And so now the warm water's on the bottom and that top cooled off pretty quickly. And so now the top is cold. So this is in winter. So when did the turnover take place? Okay, what times of years did, this, did these two things switch places? Well, it happens in the fall and the spring. And again, I'm really sorry, I'm writing nice on my board, but it's not coming out great on the PowerPoint. Um, during this time, you have the cold water is now mixing because warm warm air rises or warm water rises and cold water sinks the water is now mixing with each other and so you've got this going on here now this is the actual turnover happening it's going from warm to cold um, from this type of thing to this type of thing in the fall and the spring um, I actually don't eat fish um, from a pond this time of year because when this happens all this silt and stuff that's sitting on the bottom of this lake will kind of get churned up in the water and I really don't like the um, it kind of gets in the fish and makes them taste kind of murky um, so it's kind of like a lot of debris and stuff going around as this turnover is taking place from this to this and that's called lake turnover. And that's when the temperature switches places. Um, I've got a picture here 
of the summer conditions. You see the cold water down here and the winter conditions, the cold is up here and the fall and the spring, you'll see the water kinds of churns and turns over so it's the same temperature. So what is eutrophication? E-U-T-R-O-P-H-I-C-A-T-I-O-N Eutrophication Eutrophication is when the nutrients build up in a lake and causes this green algae scum and the lake eventually becomes a grassy meadow. Um, no lake or pond is going to be a lake and pond forever. Um, eventually it's going to turn into a grassy meadow um, because debris, debris is going to fall into it, plant life is going to die in it, and that silt that's on the bottom keeps building and building and building and building until the water basically is not above ground anymore. It's got so much debris and, and dirt and, and dead plants and leaves in it that it turns kind of into this meadow and the water is underneath it. Um, this happens a lot faster around farms because if the farmer uses fertilizer and it rains and the fertilizer goes into the pond, well, algae, green plants just love fertilizer. And so this bloom happens a lot faster. And so you can see that there is water underneath this plant, um, this plant uh, algae or whatever these are. And the sunlight can't penetrate through these plants anymore. And so all everything that's in the water, the plant life in the water is going to die. And then the fish that are in the water can't get the oxygen that they need, so they die. And so everything kind of gets choked out and then settles to the bottom. And this just continues and this cycle goes on. And many, many, many years, 20, 40 years later, 50 years later, this could turn into a grassy meadow, um, depending on how deep the water was to begin with and how much fertilizer is being used, if any at all. If not, it's going to be a pond a lot longer. Okay, so we said we'd talk about the Titanic a little bit. Um, the Titanic sank because it hit an iceberg, as you know, and the iceberg um, was is so dangerous that even if you see it, you could hit it before you even see it. Um, the reason for that is because 90% is below the surface. Um, and that part is usually wider than what you see. So if you were coming upon an iceberg, you might see it floating, but as soon as you get a chance to see it, you've probably already hit it. Um, because as we look, hopefully you've written down 90% on your number 11 in your notes. As you look, there's a picture of an iceberg and only the tip is above water. The rest of it, the huge, the most massive part is underneath the water. Okay, so I hope you guys have had some fun talking about water on the surface today and I will see you tomorrow. Please make sure that you put these notes in your portfolios because we don't want to lose them and the substitute will give you your next activity. Have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow.